I've finally moved on from Simplify 3D as my slicer. Today I'll explain why and showcase my new choice, which you may not have heard of, Super Slicer. Slicing software is a key component in your 3D printing workflow. You can't live without it, and if you don't have sufficient understanding, it's going to cripple your ability. So if confidence in your slicer is so important, then why have I gone through the pain to switching to something less familiar? Let's jump in. In case you didn't know, Simplify 3D is a 3D printer slicing program. Fundamentally, like other slicers, it takes a 3D file such as an STL and converts it to a series of G-code movements to be read by our 3D printer and to produce our object. The thing about Simplify 3D is that it's the only slicer that costs money, 150 US dollars, when its competitors are free. Well, I paid for my copy of Simplify 3D way back in 2014, and that was only after participating in their trial program and giving feedback on where I thought the software needed improvement. When I started 3D printing, Skeenforge was the slicer of choice. With most people jumping to Slick 3R once it was available, in my case, bundled inside of Repetier Host. Back when I purchased Simplify 3D, Slick 3R was only on its first stable release. Cura was around, but it was pretty obscure unless you were using an Ultimaker, and at that time, Simplify 3D offered a clear advantage in performance and features over other options. In 8 years, however, the competition has come a long, long way. These days, the two most popular slicers are Cura and Prusa Slicer. Both of them are completely open source, and both of them have quite regular and significant updates. We're talking new features, bug fixes, and support for additional new 3D printers. For Simplify 3D, the last major update was in November of 2018, and that is a long, long time ago in the world of 3D printing. To make things worse, they've been promising a major update since early 2019. And almost three years later, nothing has been delivered, frustrating me and other paying customers. So we have three options that are packed full of features and receive active development, and then a pay slicer, which is overdue for some love. It might seem obvious, but for me, it wasn't quite that simple. I get frequent comments questioning why I still use Simplify 3D, and the answer is simple. Something many people need to remember is that the best slicer is the one that works for you. The truth is, because I've been using Simplify 3D for so long, I'm really familiar with it and that makes it easy to use. Firstly, I really like the UI for the slicing settings. I like how everything is divided into tabs and there's a good amount of information, but not too much on any individual tab. I like how within my profile for a particular printer, I can have presets for different materials and that will automatically change the temperature and cooling. And that also within that same profile, I can have presets for quality and that will change things like layer height and feed rate. As a counterpoint, I've never felt comfortable with Cura's interface. I don't like how the settings are in an accordion format, which means when you start to open more than one, the interface gets very cluttered with many things packed in. Of course, we can use text to filter down the options, but that relies on the user memorizing the settings and that's asking a lot for someone unfamiliar. I wouldn't describe this interface as bad because there's too many people using it successfully. I'm just saying that for me, it just doesn't click. Previously, I made a video on whether Simplify 3D was worth the price. And in it, I compared Simplify 3D to Cura and Prusa Slicer. On two different printers, I printed a range of test prints using near default profiles, and I found the quality difference was negligible. I also tested things like seeing how hard support material was to remove, and again, there was very little difference between the three slices. For someone starting out, paying $150 over something that's free might not make any sense. I paid for Simplify 3D almost eight years ago, so the cost is no longer a factor. In Simplify 3D, I had something that I was very confident with and was able to use successfully, for instance, creating all of the G-code for my free calibration website. You also have to remember that for all of the printers I regularly use, I've built up working Simplify 3D profiles and switching slices means I'd have to do this again. You already know that I've changed slices and given what I've just said, you might be wondering why. Well, I had a component failure that exposed some of the hidden weaknesses of S3D and made me have to start again from scratch. This is a solid state drive. In fact, the Windows drive from my computer and as my label suggests, it started failing, eventually unable to boot earlier this year. 
I reinstalled Windows on a fresh SSD, installing all of my programs, and the migration was made a little bit easier because I could still access the old drive, albeit very slowly. If I was using any other slicer, there's a fair chance I could explore the hard drive and find some of my printer profiles to simply copy and paste to the new drive. Except Simplify 3D stores all of your printer profiles in the registry. If you can still boot your computer, you can come to the file menu, export the FFF profile, select which one you want, and then you'll be able to export it ready to import to any other machine. Obviously I couldn't do this, but there was still one last chance. If we come to File, Import FFF Profile, you can open up some G-code previously sliced with Simplify 3D. The file will be scanned and it will re-import the profile using those settings. But there is a catch, they'll be the exact settings that you previously printed with. And remember how I talked about having the auto settings for different materials and different qualities? When you recover a print profile this way, they're all going to be gone and there's not even anywhere on the program to start adding them back manually. Therefore, your only option is to export the FFF profile, open it in a text editor, understand the XML layout and edit it to add back that functionality. And that was an experience I really wasn't interested in. So if I was gonna go through the pain of having to build up all my printer profiles again, then why not do it on something that's new and fully featured? In a way, this failing drive actually gave me an excuse to try something new. And what I settled upon is called Super Slicer. In order for my videos to be more relevant, it would make sense for me to adopt one of the two most popular slices. But I didn't quite do this. I've already said that Cura's layout is personally a deal breaker for me, so that one was ruled out. And I've also explained that before Simplify 3D, I used to use Slick 3R. And in case you didn't know, Prusa Slicer is based on this, and therefore its interface is very similar to something that I've used before. Now you can add any custom printer you want, but it is skewed towards Prusa machines. And when I was building the Ratrig V Core 3, I had this comment from Richard Pollard suggesting I try out Super Slicer, which had all of the advantages of Prusa Slicer, but with additional support for Clipper firmware. Super Slicer is free and open source, and as the documentation states, it's forked from Prusa Slicer. Like Cura and Prusa Slicer, we have frequent updates but we have the benefit here of getting features that added to Prusa Slicer as well as some exclusives. Because of this, I see it as Prusa Slicer Plus, and there's a list of additional features on the readme of their GitHub. If you'd like to try out Super Slicer, here's what you need to get started. If you'd like to try out Super Slicer, head to the GitHub linked in the description, and then click on Releases on the right-hand panel. For most people, you're gonna want the most stable version, at the time of recording, this is 23569, so we'll scroll down to that. Here it is, and we'll come to the assets, and we have files for Mac, Windows, and Linux. So we simply download the version for our operating system. Inside the zip is a bunch of files. We don't actually need to install anything. We just need to unzip them. And for me, I did that to my Windows program files directory. And once we start up the program, the interface is very familiar if you've used Prusa Slicer. Our slicing settings are divided into three areas. The first is print settings, and that's where we find things like layer heights, perimeters, infill, support materials, speed, and so forth. The next tab is filament, and that's where we have temperatures and part cooling. And the last is printer settings. This is where we set up the coordinates of our machine and have things like custom start and NG code. Here we also have an extruder section where we put in the size of the nozzle and our retraction settings. Now there are a lot of settings here and like any good slicer, we can filter them to our level of expertise by clicking in the top right hand corner on simple, advanced or expert if you want to see the lot. For all three of these sections, you can have as many presets as you like and anytime I make a change, it will be highlighted in orange on the side and I can come up to the save icon, leaving the name as is to overwrite or if I want a new profile by editing the name and then hitting OK. Our basic workflow is to hit the plus button to add geometry, then we can click on it to have our move, scale and rotate tools, and we also have a place face on the bed, where when we click one of the highlighted faces, the object will be rotated to sit perfectly. We select from our available presets, and then click slice now. As you'd expect we get a preview, and we can look layer by layer, and also at the individual extrusions that make up that layer. The default readout is very informative, breaking down each feature, color coding it, and even saying how long it will take. Very handy if you're trying to make a more efficient profile. 
Down in our options, we can also show things like travel moves, retractions, and de-retractions. One great feature that's been added seamlessly is the ability to add physical printers. Here we tell it the type of firmware and put in our local IP address. And that means once we're finished slicing, we can click send to printer. The file will be uploaded and if we tick this box, the print will automatically start. I'm currently converting all of my regular printers to have onboard Wi-Fi. So for me, that's a huge step up in workflow. And here are some other features that my old slicer just didn't have. Now these are not necessarily exclusive to Super Slicer, just things I was missing out on with Simplify 3D. We have the previously mentioned upload direct to Wi-Fi connected printers, and we have the ability to embed thumbnails in the G-code so that they show up in the web interface. We have a lot more options when it comes to infill patterns, including the truly mesmerizing gyroid infill. We have Payton supports, where we brush an area that we think might need support, select support enforcers only, and now when we slice, that's the only area we get support. We match Simplify 3D's ability to alter the G-code via a height range. We specify a vertical region and then add parameters that we want to change for that range. In this simple example, setting a denser infill percentage for the first 10 millimeters of the model. But we can make these changes not just in vertical bands. For instance here, I've got a modifier in the shape of a box and everywhere that it overlaps the model, I've set that to have denser infill. Even without modifiers, Super Slicer is intelligent with infill. This cube has 2% density, so the top infill might be prone to sagging. But if we move up, we can see this gray layer added. This is internal bridge infill, and it's gonna provide a better platform before the top solid infill is added. Super Slicer is also intelligent when it comes to overhangs. We can see on the underside, these blue areas, the overhang has been detected and the perimeter modified. I haven't done back-to-back -back testing myself, but according to the wiki, it should make a great deal of difference. Another feature I've been missing out on is ironing. This happens after the normal solid infill is extruded on top, but then the nozzle does a final pass, going back over, melting and smoothing away the layer lines. I need to spend some more time tuning and understanding, but already the difference in top surface quality is quite profound. Finally, we have a calibration menu with a bunch of built-in geometries and tests we can complete. Selecting any of these will bring up a dialog box with pictures and instructions on how to follow the process. I'm still a novice when it comes to using Super Slicer, so there's no doubt features that I've left off that list. It's just nice to know that they're there to play with if I feel the need. It hasn't, however, been all smooth sailing. You can see here that I still haven't set up all of my printers, and that's because it's still somewhat painful to do that for the first time. This is not Super Slicer's fault, it's just how it goes when switching software. If you're starting from scratch, I'd recommend coming up to configuration and going to the wizard. You'll be presented with a list of printers down the left hand side, and you can tick any that apply to you. If your particular printer isn't listed, then tick one that's quite similar, which is what I did for the FL Sun Super Racer. The first thing you'll do is go through and set the physical size of your machine, and then copy and paste custom start and NG code you might have been using on your old slicer. Starting with the preset will also give you a range of different filament options and a range of different print settings that you can either use or modify until you get them how you like them. For some things, like in my case support material, the default settings won't really suit your machine. But after experimenting, you'll find the right settings and then they'll be saved forever. For other things, remember that there's always my free calibration site, which will quickly and easily allow you to generate towers for comparing different slicer settings back to back. To help you, I've also set up a new public GitHub repo, and in it you'll find all of my slicer profiles, and I expect to flesh these out a lot more over time. I'm really happy with Super Slicer so far, but that's just me. Please remember that the best option is the one that works best for you. It might click with you even if it's not very popular with others. If you hadn't heard about Super Slicer and will now like to give it a try, please let me know down below in the comments section. Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.